All right, so um, uh, if you could kind of briefly explain um, how, when we're looking at price to earnings for, let's say, a company like Apple and their trading, um, you know, at a pretty low multiple in comparison to the tech industry, um, why we look at the comparison in the industry compared to the company and why, how that's expensive or cheap in comparison to what their earnings are. Go for the very general because I, actually, for what you can see here, actually there are a bunch of you know, companies you know, in the technology industry. So uh, let's just back up a little. You know, stop looking at that many of uh, numbers at the same time. So just first, you know, let's think about what is exactly PE. So PE, of course, we all know how it was calculated. Do we? <laughs> yeah, price divided by earnings. Okay, so you got that part right. So, in the, in fact, if you just think of it that way, okay, price over earnings. So, what the P exactly tells you is how much price, okay, you're willing to pay for the same dollar amount of earnings. Make sense? Does that make sense to you? Anybody? Speak up if you don't. Does it make sense? You know, because P ratio is simply. You know, let's say I have a you know a, a hundred bucks okay a price okay on Apple and let's say Apple's current earning is ten dollars per share. In in that sense, what we're paying we're paying a hundred dollars for Apple's one share of the Apple stock. So basically, Apple will make ten dollars of earnings for me this year per share. Okay. And I'm paying a hundred bucks for it, and therefore I'm paying ten dollars per dollar that Apple made for me. Make sense? All right. So from that perspective, you can get a little bit of sense. Okay. So PE ratio is just telling you. Okay. The same. It's the same dollar of earnings. Okay. It's the same dollar of earnings. So earning one dollar is one dollar. Okay. Earning one one dollar would not become two dollars. Would not be but why there's some variation across different, you know, uh, different companies have different PEs. Then if you think along that route, then basically you will realize that what PE tried to tell you is, of course, the earnings will be used as this one single year this year, or sometimes you actually use next year's expected earnings, but you know, you get the, the idea, okay? So why you're willing to pay higher price? For the same dollars of earnings, what would you? Because you think it's going to grow. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so you are related to the potential growth in their earnings in the future. So one dollars earning this year does not mean the same one dollars of earnings in the future, especially when talking about the stock investments and the long run analysis. Okay, when you're analyzing the stock, again, we put we look on it. At fundamental, we're shooting for the long term, not like two months, three months ahead of time. All right. So if you look at the long term, so what we're buying, we're buying a dream. You can take, you can take it that way. Why Tesla's are trading at two hundred something? <laughs> <laughs> even if they even not even make a dime, actually they're losing your money. Okay. The EPS actually is negative, okay, as you saw. What you're buying? You're buying a dream. Okay. So, how the bigger the dream, the higher the PE ratio. Make sense? All right. So, therefore, you're not comparing the dreams in a very, well, I mean, I shouldn't say pathetic, but <laughs> very stable kind of industry, let's say, utility companies. Okay. Regardless, okay, everybody has to use, you can use your utility, water, electricity, you know, gas. You know, you know that's going to be there regardless. No matter we're poor or we're rich, you know, we pretty much just use that. All right. So, what's the dream out of that kind of company? Well, well, we still can hope. Okay, we still can hope. Still can dream. Okay, there's a certain growth out there down the road. Okay, how big that can be? Uh, you know, as yeah, so yeah. yeah, technology company. And we have seen Apple, okay? I've seen Apple. 
what happened to Apple in the past several years? Wall Street. It was me. All right? So Tesla, basically, kind of the same story. Of course, you know, whether or not it's overpriced is a different story, but at least you do see that kind of big of a dream is out there. Therefore, people are willing to pay premium for that. And saying that that's the base fundamental idea in the PE analysis. When you're looking at a PE ratio, why are you going to put the PE ratio not Know, across all kinds of the companies in the market, but just put it along with other companies in the same industry, and most likely what we will begin with is what's the average P ratio in the technology industry, because that's your lead, okay? You're not, you're not going to ask, you know, uh, the not even the college football players who play, you know, against, you know, uh, the NFL kind of professional teams. You're not putting them. I mean, they're not from the same league. So, you know, you're putting them together, competing with each other. It's not fair. Make sense? So, you need to compare people from the same league. And therefore, when you're looking at this, your analysis will just, you know, be what's the average? So, basically, the industry average PE just tell you on average how big the dream you're seeking in the specific industry. While, of course, we do see. There are still differences, you know, those big giant, uh, technology giants such as you know, Apple, Samsung, you know, uh, HP, IBM have been in the industry quite a while. Some of them have shown big, you know, impact in the industry, while the others, let's see what's on the top of um, the list. Computer parallels, uh, what's it? Is that a copy? No, that's just oh, a, oh, it's that's a, a subcategory. subcategory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, are, are apples, you know, actually selling computer peripherals? Oh, well, they are, okay. But is that their main, the core business? Well, if you tell me, you know, if Apple's core business is selling uh, magic mouse or <laughs> or their cables, well, yeah. But really not, okay. So, okay, here we go. So let's see, INT Corp, uh, LTD, uh, well, anyone? Do you know what company that is? I don't. <laughs> it's just cross list, but it's not. I would say so. Yeah, yeah it's int.ax probably is from a different stock exchange. Yeah. But anyhow, you get an it's Australia. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> AX Aussie. Yeah. So, again, okay, so industry average gives you a rough idea, okay, how big the dream you're seeking in the specific. But again, in the same league, there's a good, there are good teams, there are bad teams. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I'm more familiar with baseball. So uh, yeah, and I'm from Texas. So uh, it's not fair saying, hey, you're looking for exactly the same performance from Texas Rangers. You know, who <laughs> unfortunately you know, it's almost made to the end of the list. You know, in terms of performance, and uh, along with you know uh, the ones who are competing. World Series now, you know, uh, San Francisco Giants or uh, Kansas City Royals. Can you remember anything? I mean, Royals. Uh, well, anyway, <laughs> that's a different story. So again, there are good teams, there are bad teams. Okay, you're not going to shoot for the same thing of those teams. Of course, we're talking about good teams and bad teams. And now we already see the results. So let's back up, you know, to the beginning of the season. You know, we do see the rosters. You know. That's the fundamental analysis again, okay? Uh, I'm talking about fundamental analysis, okay? Looking at the rosters, their pitching staff, you know, their hitting, okay? And their coaches, okay? All those fundamentals you're putting together, you can roughly tell whether or not it's a good team, all right? So you see half of the team, the roster, it just promoted it from the minor league, you know, these recent years. How hopeful you are. Well, maybe you can have hope because you know all all the uh, all the minor leaders, you know, they are actually listed on top list of the uh, VA top hundred you know, uh, minor league players. Well, then maybe you can be hopeful that way. But you can tell, right? You can tell. I mean, you know it well. Again, that's why reason why I say the qualitative thing is a complement for the fundamental analysis. Okay, from those qualitative stuff, and you can tell. Okay, you. It is a good team or it is a bad team. 
Okay, are we comparing this team with the average here, or actually we're talking about a good team, so we should compare it with the good team? You will not ask New York, New York uh, sorry, you will not ask New York Yankees to say, hey, uh, the New York Yankees, you know, whoever in their front office, they're, they're, not, good, they're not going to tell you that saying, okay, let's see, you know, um, the well, actually, the Pirates nowadays are uh, team too. So uh, I cannot think of uh, Triple A team too. Oh, like, uh, like, like Astros, like, the okay. Rangers, okay. the Rangers. Rangers. Uh, so, yeah, Rangers is just had bad luck. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I have to you know, call it content. Okay, so let's look at the Astros. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ruba is always <laughs> some words to say about Astros. So, New York Yankees is not going to say, hey, the Astros has been in a bad way for some reason. Let's take it easy, right? Okay. They're not going to. Their, their goal, what's their goal? Their goal is world championship every single year. So you're not going to ask for a good team to shoot for that down, you know, lower goal. And therefore, you should do the same, okay? ASPE analysis, why you're compared, you need to find a competitive, the comparable companies to compare with. Okay, you're not going to compare Apple with what we just saw. Uh, you know, not Johnson and Johnson for sure, right? <laughs> you're not talking about the same thing. So that's why you know, the PE ratio actually you know, exists to be that thing, okay? If you're paying for the dream, okay, you, know, you need to know first how big the dream is. And then second, okay, among the same, you know, the same group is seeking for the same dream, everybody is shooting for a war series, and you do know there are some people can, does have the chance to reach that goal, and while the others, you know for a fact, okay, they're not going to make it. Okay. So you just need to know where to compare. Thank you. Um, so uh, you guys can assume that the price earnings there's a high correlation between the price of the stock. Everybody know what correlation is, right? We've taken business statistics with Dr. Evers, right? You know what lower. So there's a high correlation between um, the pattern of the PE and uh, what we see in the stock price. Um, so we've learned a lot today, um, and you got to digest it, right? Fundamentals. Oh yeah. Um, uh, Next time when we do a technical or the technical day, uh, we're going to go a little bit over price earnings growth. Um, so we're going to we have a couple models that show uh, predictability for the growth of PE, um, so that we can kind of get a, a better picture of where we see the stock going. Um, we have one more technical uh, day that is kind of mandatory. We're not going to record it. I'm, I'm requiring everybody to be here. So, um, but I that will uh, be sometime late next week, either Thursday or Friday. Uh, most likely Friday again. Uh, so uh, keep that on your calendar. Uh, but as far as this goes, are there any questions? The fundamental stuff. Did everybody learn something today? Great. Okay, uh, Dr. Evis has uh, another one of his yes. fellow colleagues to introduce. Yes, uh, he's Dr. Al Gorbus. He is a uh, very, very good friend of mine. Well, Dr. Chen, they're, they're very, very good. Both of them are very good friends of mine. So and, uh, <laughs> yeah, you uh, take a couple minutes to come oh, up. Oh, sure. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. I know uh, a couple of them have to leave. I know she has to babysit and he's got to go. Oh, no, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I came in late. I apologize. I actually was in a meeting. Um, I, I watched some of the presentation, which was very good, by the way, and, and thank you for bringing up a lot of this stuff here. What I was having a hard time understanding was that what kind of backgrounds do you guys come with? I mean, have you, how many of you have taken a finance class before? Okay, so half of you, or you've taken it too? Kind of? How do you kind of take it? <laughs> <laughs> That's my Okay, what I'm trying to say is this. Some of the stuff, as great as it is to someone who's already been exposed to it, I don't know how many of you were actually following it 100%. Were you? You don't want to admit? Or, yeah. no? The reason I'm saying that is this. Um, by the way, a, a quick thing about me, uh, uh, my background, uh, same, same, similar educational backgrounds, but from a professional background, this was my job, basically. I worked for a, a company called Curl Holdings, where I evaluated about $33 billion portfolio, where I looked at the investments that these guys made across the world. The reason I'm saying that is this. 
this stuff can get extremely technical very quickly and extremely difficult to follow. But the problem is, or the good news is, you don't have to know a lot of it to actually succeed in finance. In fact, a little bit of it goes a long way. It's the difference between becoming an Olympic swimmer where every five years you go maybe faster by half of a second versus learning to swim for the first time. As long as you learn how to swim for the first time, you're going to actually go a huge way. In other words, you can make a lot of money in this thing without necessarily knowing a lot of information. Of course, the more you know, the more comprehensive of an investor you become. But at the end of the day, I mean, things, at the end of the day, that boils down to two things, and I apologize if I'm repeating anything that, that you guys already said. It boils down to two things. Am I looking at the risk reward relationship appropriately, and what tools do I use to see if something is risky versus the reward that it's giving is appropriate or not? That's what you were talking about, the mispricing. Is it paying enough kind of a thing? You know, whenever we say returns, it's the most basic kind. Is there a marker? An extremely basic. When we say anyone here, what, what is the return? Anyone? How much you get back for the money you put in? Okay, but that's a layman's term. What I'm trying to get to is what do you what, what do you mean by how much you get back in like dollars, percentages? What what is it? Uh, return on capital. Okay, here's here is the answer to that. The answer is first of all, returns are always expressed in percentages, right? If we the simplest way of looking at it is you started with $100, you ended up with 110 So what's your return 10%, right? Extremely basic, right? And all we're trying to do with this stuff, and again, you can get very technical, but you don't have to. All we're trying to see is this return, is it appropriate for the risk level for this company, number one? Number two, that's the fundamental analysis that everybody was talking about before. And I mean, you can become an expert in fundamental analysis, but you can have a newcomer right beside you, and through their intuition, they can kick your ass, basically. <laughs> so don't get discouraged whenever you see a million different things that are thrown in there. That's how we make money, to cr by creating a lot of useless stuff. <laughs> so the thing is, fundamental analysis basically looks at the risk-return relationship. And you know we look at the company and see if this return is appropriate for its risk, so on and so forth. But we also have the technical stuff that some of you referred to. The other side is the behavioral side, right? And behavioral side, all behavioral side is we're not robots, we all have emotions, and we're although sometimes we see something and we know what the right thing to do is, but we still don't do it. How many of you, well let me put it this way, have you realized that it's much harder to study for a hard exam than it is for an easy exam? In fact, you should study even harder for a hard exam, right? But it's you, you avoid the hard exam studying completely. Do you know why you do that? Anyone? Because you look at it and you're like, yeah. Risk well, no. Hard. You know that you're going to, well, if you fail, you'll feel stupid. So what you say is if you work very hard for something and you fail, you'll feel stupid. So might as well not work for it at all. And if I fail it, look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, I didn't study for any of this. And feel good about yourself. <laughs> as sad that that is, that is true oh, human nature. And as crazy as that sounds, a lot of these investors follow very similar behavioral patterns in their psyche. So although they know that they should sell a stock, they don't, because they're afraid of some emotional swing. And the fundamental analysis assumes that everybody's rational at the end of the day, but we're not. We're all we're not machines. The cool thing is, if you know yourself, you can a lot of times predict what the other investors will be doing. So. Long story short, you can actually profit from investing without knowing a lot of technical stuff, if I'm making any sense. Of course, the more you know, the more prolific you're going to become, so on and so forth. But I think that's the biggest thing that I can tell you. We know a lot of technical stuff. Yeah, doing a, I get those for, for my students. Uh, well, you've done a PhD in this. Of course you know. Trust me, all we learned is more and more math, nothing else, which a lot of times is useless, I promise you. At the end of the day, what comes down to it is, is well, it is true. What it comes down to is, do you understand intuition? Do you have a few tools that you really sit down and try to follow? And trust me, a lot of the students in the United States say, well, I'm not a math person, I hate math. I, 
Here's the truth of the matter. My first point here. You know more math than you need, I promise you. Even the little math you think you know is more than enough to actually do it. And yeah, I think intimidation kills most people, not the math skills. And uh, I think I really think that if you understand that this stuff can get complicated, you look, there are stuff that we will look at side by side, and I'll be like, dude, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. And I did a PhD in this, I have no idea what he's talking about. It happens to all of us. You don't have to understand everything. But if you understand a few basic stuff, you can make a lot of money in this field. And the truth of the matter is, yes, luck plays a big role too, but this is an educated guess game. In other words, you're not going to Vegas and putting your, all your money in red and then hoping from God that you're going to make some money. This is, it doesn't work that way. In finance, in fact, if you especially understand certain topics, it's like, well, there's a 90, like, it's a 10-90 split that you can, if you bet on this and understand that it is 90, 90% 90 of the time you're going to win. Who offers those kinds of odds in real Not life? Stock market does, if you understand what you're doing. And I think the understanding part does not necessarily require a PhD, I guarantee you that. And uh, hopefully you, you know, you have a lot to learn from Dr. Iglas. Actually, I learned a lot from Dr. Iglas. So try your best to, to go with the stuff. And, you know, the, yeah, PE ratios, you gave a perfect example and a great uh, explanation of PE ratios, but how many of you followed 100% what P ratio is? You did, if you actually understood the earlier stuff. What I'm trying to say is start slow. You don't have to necessarily jump all the way into the complicated stuff very quickly. If you start slow, you're gonna go a long way. And when you're starting slow, like a lot of the investment students that I have, with the simulations, investment simulations, and things like that, and that's my field, they start, and it's crazy that some of these students beat me in the stock market simulation. And I'm like, dude, how do you do this? And the, 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 he doesn't know, or she doesn't know that much about finance, but intuition actually goes a long way. So here are the things about finance. Courage, extremely important. You can have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't have the courage, it's meaningless. You can have a lot of courage and zero knowledge, you're stupid if you're investing in the stock market. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, you have to find that balance. In the real market right now, we have a lot of people with huge amounts of core courage, zero knowledge. All they're doing is gambling their lives away. And we have a lot of people who know a lot, but are scared to actually go into the market because they are too risk averse, as we call it. Do you know what I mean by risk averse? They, risk aversion is basically how much you hate risk. If someone's risk averse, they don't like risk very much, right? There has to be a balance between them. First, you need to have the knowledge, and trust me, finance classes, something that you would take from a person like Dr. Ribas, gives you adequate information to have enough knowledge to do this. All you need after that is courage. And um, my biggest advice to you, please do the simulations as much as you can, and start early. I have students, and I'm sure they, they do too, that are like 55, 60 sometimes. And the guy goes, I wish I knew this stuff 30 years ago. Yeah, I wish my students that are 30 years younger than you understand that they should be doing this right now. Make sense? I hope I didn't uh, put a hole in your ear, but that's my perspective. But without getting into the whole explanation, trust me, any basic finance book will teach you most of this stuff anyways, as long as you can follow step by step. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, I remember when when I was in Texas, uh, we, we had that simulation, and a few of my students beat me like in the first month. Yeah. I was I was in terms of, well, what happened? Well, you know, Apple was gonna announce their earnings, you know, so I put all my all my money into Apple, you know, the earnings were really good, you know, the stock jumped like crazy. It's very basic intuition, right? And I was like, well, you know, I, I was following an S&P 500 portfolio. You know, so. Oh, another advice that I can give you. Do not invest in stuff just to invest. The best advice that an invest that beginner investor sh should get is first pick five or six stocks, look at them, and study them. And what I mean by study, don't, you're not necessarily going to do all technical you know, blast on, but study them, understand those companies, 
and only invest in stuff you understand. Do not venture away into things that you don't understand. Trust me, because there are people in that market that understand that market and will take advantage of your lack of knowledge in that market. You should know. You know. Another thing uh, that, that is uh, good advice for a beginner investor is um, understand that most people in the stock market, and I, I promise you this is true, most people in the, most participants in the stock market don't know much about the stock market. Now, you can say, well, that's not true. Of course, there are all these hedge funds. Most of the money that's traded in the stock market is done by people who know. But most of the number of participants that are in the market are actually done by people who don't know. You know what happens? Most of the money gets shifted from the people who don't know to the ones that know. And what I'm trying to say is even a basic finance class that you take will put you in the category of the no. Make sense? And that gives you a, a substantial amount of advantage that a lot of investors don't get. In fact, I had one student last semester in my investment class. This guy is managing millions of dollars of people's retirement money. And this guy is taking an investment class, graduate level, for the first time. I said, Dude, you're managing millions of dollars of people's life savings. And I asked him a very basic topic. You know, I don't have to mention that here, but it was a very basic investment topic. I said, do you know anything about this? He goes, first time I'm hearing it. <laughs> My heart just stopped at that moment. <laughs> but that's proof to you that a lot of people that are in there don't know. College actually does give you a lot of information. As long as you have courage to apply it, it gives you enough information. And you have experienced people, clearly, that know what they're doing. So I hope uh, I made sense, and I hope that it wasn't redundant with what they were telling you. But uh, it was a pleasure being here. So most of you are uh, what year? Uh, mix. Uh, we just had a senior. He left. Uh, most of it, yeah, a couple seniors. and uh, uh, most You guys should try to get as much as you can out of this program before you leave, right? Um, freshman, sophomore, junior, um, pretty much all of them pretty much, yeah. That's cool. Well, guys, um, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. And give thank you. I'm sure they've already, of course, you know Dr. Bus very well. I'm sure that uh, Hang Sheng already shared it with you, too. Here's my email, al.gormas at t-a-m-u-c dot e-d-u, Texas a &M Commerce. And uh, if you have any what? questions, you can't get a hold of anybody else. That's, that's why I did like, like, like in, a, in a slide, in. it might be easier. Oh, yeah. Because I don't think they can read that, that well. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. So, uh,